Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Yeah. And three, two. Hi, uh, my name's Stephen Scott. I'm chair of the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the first of our In Conversation series. These are going out live and also recorded webinars and podcast discussions with the leading players in child and, that, child and young people's mental health. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Sir Robin Murray, Fellow of the Royal Society, who has spent a lifetime researching what leads up to psychoses and what can be done about them. Um, he has illuminated this field across several different aspects, which I hope to draw out to Robin today. Uh, welcome. And I guess I'd like to ask you, what got you interested in psychoses? Well, before I answer that, I say that you're kicking off this inaugural series with experts in child psychiatry, but I'm not an expert in child psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, an adult psych, a, a psych, a psychiatrist specialising in psychosis, but of course, I think now we see more psychosis in, in young people, so I myself get more involved in, in the care or in, uh, and assessment of, of younger people with psychosis. So how did I get in, involved with psychosis? When I was a medical student in Glasgow, I discovered that there was a deal that you could get free board and lodging in one of the local mental hospitals, they were called asylums then, I, it was called Leverendale, and medical students were employed to do physical examinations. So the Scottish law was that people who were chronically in psychiatric hospitals, every year they needed to have a physical examination. I, and uh, so, I, so I became one of four medical students who, who did that and we were looked after so well. <laughs> I, it, uh, the, I guess the catering department had a limited budget uh, for all the patients and they liked some, sometimes to, to cook a little <coughs> bit extra so the medical students were the beneficiaries <laughs> of, of, of this. But as part of that there was always psychotic people wandering around the grounds and always you could always talk to them and uh, and and so I got to know quite a lot of what would be called chronic psychotic people uh, at that time and of course was it's, an, it is fascinating to talk to such people. It is, wow. And uh, so you carried on in this field, did you? Yeah, well, for, I, I got deviated into, uh, into renal disease for, uh, for three, three or four years, but eventually I came back to my first love, which was psychiatry, and came to London, and yeah. then got in, 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 most interested in psychosis. And what were the prevailing theories of the cause of psychosis and indeed the treatments then? Well, the world was split into two diametrically opposed groups. <clears throat> there were the hardline bi biologists who thought after Krepelin that schizophrenia was a genetic disorder, that it was a brain disorder, that, and it was a deteriorating disorder. Uh, so there was that group. I, Elliot Slater was the great proponent of, 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 of that view. He was a very famous geneticist uh, who, who worked here at that time. And one of my colleagues said he was very interested in the history of the patient right up to the time of birth. <laughs> After that, he, he was interested in things like genetics and his, the mother's yeah. pregnancy and labour and things like that. So it was that sort of group, hardline biologists. And at the other extreme, there were... Uh, Psychoanalytically, psychoanalytically oriented people who didn't believe there was any genetic component, didn't believe there was any biological component, and thought that uh, many of the problems originated from a uh, bad parenting, or for example, the refrigerator uh, <laughs> mother, the mother who was was cold in relation to her child, or. Uh, interpersonal difficulties, marital schism and skew, they called it. They, 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 done st they did studies showing that the parents of uh, people with schizophrenia uh, were rather strange and odd. 
I and published this, but they, what they never did was to study the parents of normal children. They discovered when they did this, discovered the rest of parents like us. We were just as strange and odd as the parents of people with schizophrenia. Yes. And so, when I was first of all a psychology student, uh, there was quite a lot of almost cult following of a fellow Scottish psychiatrist, R.D. Lang, um, who had a theory. I think that schizophrenia was a sort of flight from reality into a journey of experience. And it seemed to me at the time there were quite a lot of adherents of these beliefs. Yes, well, because Ronnie Lyon came from Glasgow, when I was actually in Glasgow, I read all his books and I went, I was in a different mental hospital where he had worked <coughs> called Gartnable, <coughs> and I was determined to find some uh, notes written by the great prophet R.D. Lyon. I thought this might be uh, some great new insight into. Uh, uh, the, uh, psychotic patients thinking and I looked through all the old note, uh, all the notes of, of people, some of them dead and so on eventually I found a note which said 2am called to ward, this elderly lady has fallen and fractured her femur <laughs> R.D. Lang <laughs> and that was the only thing I ever found No wonderful but, but interpretation he, No, he, he at, at that time of the morning I guess that was enough yes. so I Certainly, uh, Ronnie Lang was a well, he was a huge figure, not just in psychiatry, but he was. This was the time of the Vietnam War. He was leading lead, leading protests. He was uh, meeting with the Beatles. Uh, he was a sort of a sort of general guru of, yes. of wise words, and he was also a poet. And he he he, he read his poetry with a very strong uh, Glasgow accent, and it was a bit difficult to understand anybody, <laughs> yeah, but for people who are from outside Glasgow, it was, it was incomprehensible, and therefore they thought it must be brilliant. Uh, so uh, Ronnie Lang was a huge uh, uh, figure really on the, the idea that psychosis was understandable, and even that psychosis was a normal reaction to a mad world, and that people should be allowed to express themselves. On the other hand, Lang said, so in some, some ways we, we think these are, the ideas are ridiculous, but on the other hand he said people with psychosis are much more understandable than uh, most psychiatrists believe. Most psychiatrists believe this is a brain disease, it's like Alzheimer's, it's not much point wondering what the voices are about, but R R R Ronnie Lang said you can understand people, and of course this is what psychologists, the basis of CBT, that you can understand the development of the del delusions. And of course he also said that uh, psychiatry is often a coercive force as an agent of the state. And sadly I think uh, yeah. that still is the case for people like us who, 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 who practice in the inner city where people have appalling conditions. I, and really we ought to address the conditions they live in, but instead we patch them up by taking them into hospital. Yeah, well that's a fair point. So, so Robin, as a young researcher you've got the brain and genetics people on one side and the psychosocial experience one on the others. How did you go about tackling these? What research strategies did you deploy? What, well, what did you end up doing? The, the, the sad thing, of course, was that those of an analytical bent or social analytical bent didn't do any research. It was thought to be too difficult. Of course, now, now, now they do. I worked for a while with uh, Jim Burley, who yeah. I was uh, uh, very famous for having looked at we looked at the effect of life events and showed that people with psychosis often broke down following life events. But at that time we tended to think this was just a trigger. We didn't think it was necessarily uh, a, a real cause. So there wasn't much opportunity to do research in, uh, in the psychosocial field. And at that time North, North American psychiatry had been totally analytical, that every chairman of every department in North America was a psychoanalyst, and it just began to change in the 1970s. So I went to the States for a year uh, to learn a bit about uh, uh, neuroscience and, uh, 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 and neurotransmitters, and then I came back, and by accident the gentleman, uh, Jerry Shields, who ran our twin register here, he died quite young and he was a very shy man and not many people went to his funeral. So I went to his funeral together with the then professor of psychiatry and on the way back he said uh, uh, to me, 
we're going to have to, to shut down this twin twin register, this twin unit, because there's nobody who, who could, could uh, run it. I said, well, no, not, not, not yet, please. <laughs> I, could, I could run it, even though I knew nothing about genetics. But that, that, so that got me started by accident into studying twins and then into other biological st studies. But one of the first studies we did was taking identical twins where one had schizophrenia and one was well, and we were able to show that the one with schizophrenia had bigger cerebral ventricles and decreased cortical volume compared with the person the, with their co-twin who who didn't have schizophrenia. Okay, so this wasn't comparing <coughs> monozygotic identical twins versus non-identical. This is within identical yes, ones. Yes, people who had identical yeah. genes. Yeah. So, so this is kind of interesting because that almost suggests well, genes are not all the story then. Oh yes, and of course we we, we know that that only fifty percent of cases where where you have one person who has schizophrenia or psychosis, the second twin, 50% or, 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 or more um, cases, will be entirely yeah. well. And, and their offspring, the, the, the well ones offspring? Well, well, well offspring, they seem to still have an increased risk. So yeah. it's as if you're, you're, you're transmitting the, 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 vul the genetic vulnerability, but then I, adverse things have to happen to you to, to, to light up this vulnerability. Yes. And, and on the genetic front, how early now do we think in those who are going to develop schizophrenia um, there is an abnormality in brain development? Or Well, it varies. And what we do know is that there are a small proportion of people who develop psychosis who have uh, uh, quite a major genetic defect called the copy number vari variation, where they actually lose a chunk of... Uh, of, the, of their DNA, and it may, not, may knock out four or five genes, or a, 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 you know, fifteen genes. And if these genes are involved in neurodevelopment, then naturally they're going to 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 to, to have difficulties from early on in life. That probably accounts for about three percent of people with schizophrenia. Okay, As so I understand, it's maybe fifteen percent of people with autism. Yeah. Uh, so these folk we would think of as having a developmental schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh, but a, the, maybe about a third of people with, with, who develop a schizophrenia I will have had difficulties in childhood, not just being a little bit slower to, to, to walk or to talk, a few months slower, I, not doing quite so well at school as their brothers and sisters, IQ maybe being a five points below <coughs> brothers, and, uh, brothers and sisters. Yeah, nothing really to get dramatically worried about, and you can't obviously take all of these folk and say you're at risk of, uh, of developing schizophrenia, but it's just an indicator that for some people they've had uh, some developmental brain problem. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> and on the other hand, I know you have led studies which have shown really quite a lot of variation, for example, within Europe in the uh, incidence of psychosis. Is that the case? And Yes, uh, they, well, I, I haven't led these studies, I've been in, in, involved in them. Uh, Jim Van Oss, in particular from uh, Holland, has, has led them. But uh, they are, we've, we've looked at 16 different sites across Europe, and there are, there are sadly, there are a few things that the British lead on any longer, <laughs> but uh, sadly we, uh, we lead on the, the incidence of psychosis. So the incidence of psychosis in a paper just published uh, a Hannah Jongsma et al. in JAMA Psychiatry, it showed that uh, the incidence of psychosis is 10 times higher in South London than it is in parts of S Spain and Southern it Italy. So it's a dramatic difference. Wow, that is a huge difference. It's not 30% yes. or 40%, 10 times. Yes. A thousand percent. I mean, that is gobsmacking, isn't it? Yes. It, it certainly surprised us. Now, we trained everybody that you had to get every every person who developed psychosis from your area and you had to use the same diagnostic instruments and so on. So I think people use the same uh, criteria. Now, maybe the people in Spain or Italy, maybe they missed a few cases. They didn't miss nine out of ten uh, cases. So undoubtedly there is a big difference. And we know some of the causes. And I think we know that... Uh, migration increases the risk of so uh, risk of psychosis yes. and we know that london and the other place with with uh, the other places with high incidence were amsterdam and paris yes. 
that they've had lots of migrants coming for many, many years. And we know that when you move from one country to another, you're more prone to paranoia and to developing a psychosis. So when you take away migrants and their children, the difference uh, diminishes maybe about a third. So, so, but, so there are obviously still other factors. Okay. But that is still interesting, Robin, because some people have had a theory that the people who've got the gump to get up and go and migrate are the more intelligent, mentally healthier, have not the left behind us. So it is still interesting, isn't it? It mm. must be illuminative what is their experience. Yes, I, 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 I think you're correct. That by and large, migrants are often, are often more able. Now, you can't say that migrants from Syria are moving for the same uh, same no. reasons as migrants <coughs> from Finland, but in general, I think I think what you say is correct. But I guess think of think of the experience of some of, of somebody from from Syria at present that they've been bombed and their friends and and and, and the relatives slaughtered. They somehow they somehow escape <coughs> over the, the treacherous mountains. They get to Turkey where they're exploited and their money stolen. They, they then get put in a boat that maybe sinks and they have to go back and then try again. So these people are really traumatised. Yes. So um, is there better evidence phenomenologically that it is uh, anxiety and trauma that predisposes to the onset of psychosis? So, so we do know that... Uh, we, I guess you can, we can, we can think. What about child trauma? Which, of course, yeah. uh, many many people uh, watching, uh, listening, will be very familiar with. That until maybe ten years ago, it was not thought that ch that uh, child abuse uh, was associated with psychosis. But we now know that child abuse is bad for all psychiatric disorders, uh, practically, and. Uh, uh, and psychosis is no exception. So the usual th things, physical, sexual abuse, child, childhood neglect, all increase the risk. But so too do bullying and adverse life events, particularly of a victimization type. So for an adult psychiatrist, if you, if your boyfriend dumps you or your, your uh, 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 girlfriend dies, uh, or, or you, you suffer a loss, you're more likely to develop depression. But yes. if you're assaulted in the street, or, a, 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 or you're, you're, you're bur burgled, or have some intrusive life event, then this seems to be more associated with the psychosis. And I think in the last 20 or 30 years, there has been a coming together of psychosocial and brain explanations, because <clears throat> at one level, every event has to be interpreted by the brain. Are we any further in understanding um, how these psychosocial events might affect the brain, or are they completely out with no, no, I think neurotransmitter well, explanations? I think so this, there, has, there has been a biological explanation for a long time that you might inherit genes which might make you more prone to developmental problems or to dopaminergic abnormalities. And psychosis is associated with when you're acutely psychotic and things around seem very strange and you're hearing voices <laughs> and you think uh, uh, people may be out to harm you, that's associated with an excess uh, synthesis and release of dopamine in the striatum. And we, that's very clear. And it subsides, uh, you know, I, I, as you get better. But, uh, so there was this biological the theory, genes to, to dopamine that could could be understood. And then there was a sort of social theory which we didn't know how it fitted at all. But now there's increasing evidence that uh, social adversity or social stress, child abuse, migration, they all impact on the dopamine system. That is fascinating, isn't it? Yes. So you, there's a very nice, uh, well, it's, it's a nasty test called the Montreal Stress Test, where they take a group of people and they say, we're all going to do a, a, a arithmetic. And uh, you, you'll be in a PET scanner, and at the end of the, we'll finish the experiment. We'll 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 put a board up on how everybody did, it, who who was best and who was worst, and then they make it just too difficult for you to to manage. If you manage to to do it right, they, they increase the difficulty, and then as you're doing it, even when you get it right, they say wrong. <laughs> 
and you say, you know, four times 20, I thought that was right. But by that time, you're on to the next one. And then you get more and more anxious. And then a voice says, you're doing very badly. You're the worst in your group. Yeah. You, can you try harder? It's a very expensive test. And of course, people get very, very stressed. Yeah. And when you do that to, 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 to ordinary folk, then you, you see a, re a release of dopamine <coughs> in the striatum. But people in what we call the prodrome, or the, who have the at-risk mental state for psychosis, who are teetering on the brink of, of developing psychosis, they release more dopamine. So they are more, their dopamine system is more vulnerable to stress. Yes. People who are already psychotic, they show even, a, even an even greater response to the wow. stress. So no, we, we know acute stress causes this. We know that if you take young people, if you take young men, split them into those who have been abused as a child and those who haven't been abused as a child. The, the ones who have been abused as a child, they release more dopamine as well. Golly. And migrants too, surprisingly. Just one study for migrants. But maybe when you're more insecure and you're stressed, uh, if you're a migrant, uh, you, you maybe don't feel quite so comfortable. Uh, so a whole range of social factors are now shown to impact on the dopamine system, which we know impacts on your likelihood of going psychotic. Yes. This is so interesting because, of course, there's an <coughs> increased interest now in adverse childhood experiences and the mechanisms through which they may work, including inflammatory, but and the dopamine as, yes. as well. Yes, also uh, 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 other theories. Uh, we, that, that, the problem when I started psychiatry for psychosis, there was just two theories which we discussed, and there really were we didn't have any known causes for, for psychosis. Now we've got almost too many causes, lots of genes and a whole <coughs> range of social adversities. Yeah, fascinating. Well, what I'd like to take you on, which I know will be of interest to um, adolescent uh, mental health workers, is the whole role of drugs, Robin, and um, the extent to which uh, they can be important in psychosis. On the one hand, as, as a father of children who've just left teenage, I know there's an awful lot of drugs out there. They are seen by young people as fairly harmless. We have David Nutt who said that cannabis is safer than horse riding. Uh, that may be using death as the end point, I think. Um, could you tell us about your own studies and uh, uh, where we're at on that whole issue? I'll just correct you, he said, oh, David sorry. said that ecstasy was oh, I'm more, very sorry. Oh, I don't ecstasy know. was more safer than, than, oh, than, okay. than, than horse riding. And actually, he was on the radio when a gentleman phoned up and said, hey, Dr. Professor Nutt, my uh, daughter is about to be 14. I'd been thinking of buying her a pony. Should I buy her five years supply of ecstasy instead? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember his reply, but uh, oh, so so uh, ecstasy itself actually is not associated with an increased risk of, of of psychosis, but it's the drugs that are have especially an effect on dopamine, which is cocaine, uh, amphetamine, and metam methamphetamine across the Pacific in Australia and uh, and South Africa. South Africa, in some places, a third of all the people with psychosis are methamphetamine psychotic. Wow. Uh, uh, what, are, what are the street names of methamphetamine? Um, uh, uh, actually, I don't know the, the street names because we don't actually, <laughs> we don't, uh, we, I've only actually only seen one, one person. Uh, 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 right, no, uh, I just uh, 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 need uh, to know what to tell people to avoid tonight. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, excuse me, crystal meths would be, I, 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 I'm forgetting, but, but uh, uh, so far we've been lucky. We haven't had much uh, uh, meth, meth, methamphetamine. A cat, which is a, 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 a drug which is used in the Horn of Africa where people chew leaves, yes, it can yes. induce psychosis, and, uh, but particularly cannabis. And when when, certainly when I was young, psychiatrists didn't bother about cannabis. It didn't seem to be uh, very important. But from the 1990s, we started seeing more psychotic people who were using cannabis. At first, we used to ignore it. But then, gradually, as the relatives kept telling us, you need to pay attention to this, we started. And so we know that cannabis, old-fashioned cannabis, has a modest effect on increasing risk of psychosis. But a what we would call high-potency cannabis. is maybe about 
four or five times stronger than all, all the is, is this skunk? Maybe in the UK it would be it would be called skunk. In Holland it would be called a uh, netherweed, and so the d different places are are a a whole whole range of different di different uh, names in di in, di in different countries, and we know that these high potency types are much more risky. So around here. Uh, you, in South London, your risk of psychosis is about five times higher if you use high potency skunk uh, every day. And so around here, about 25% of all cases of psychosis are due to wow. the use of high potency cannabis. Across Europe, I can tell you that in Holland, over 50% are, are due to high potency, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, to cannabis in, in Holland is mostly high potency. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Bologna or Palermo, less than 5%, uh, because they, they, they don't use so much cannabis, and what they use is, uh, is, is much less potent. Yes, so in my day, we used to see people in the emergency clinic, and within a week, they were better. But what I'm hearing is it can lead to irreversible. Yes, you still see people who go acutely psychotic. I, I once I gave a lecture and the, afterwards, the chairman, who was a psychiatrist, said, I didn't like to see publicly. But I went psychotic once. I had a, a very good, nice girlfriend who was a great <laughs> cook. And she made a cake for my birthday. And I ate a lot. And she was getting more and more alarmed. Then I went psychotic, he said. She'd put, she'd put cannabis in the cake. So I, a chap like that, I forced it. We'll just have an acute psychosis. Uh, and a few uh, a few uh, days later will be all right. So, people who just uh, go acutely psychotic, if they've taken a really big dose, if if they're not being chronic users, they can certainly recover quickly. But chronic users can be led into schizophrenia. Yes. So, yeah. cannabis use is a component cause, what we call a component yes. cause. There is no single cause, no. but genetic vulnerability, obstetric insult, I. Uh, childhood adversity, being a migrant, using cannabis, all of these are risk factors that add up to push you over the threshold yes. into psychosis. And, and now, is it true that it's just the same thing that's stronger, or is some of the balance of the components of modern I street cannabis? I've been reading this up. I, 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 maybe your children have been telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, the psychotogenic substance in cannabis is tetrahydrocannabinol or THC and we can take normal volunteers, lots of people volunteer for this and give them intravenous THC <laughs> yes. and so they get a bit of a high but a proportion uh, get paranoid and suspicious and even have a, a brief psychosis. But cannabidiol or CBD is the other biggest uh, component of the, uh, of, of the cannabis plant. And if you actually give people CBD and then give them intravenous THC, they don't go psychotic. Uh, they maybe get a bit anxious, and, but they, you, you can ameliorate this. Now, if you think of uh, hashish or old-fashioned resin, uh, it would have 3 or 4% THC and 3 or 4% uh, CBD. Skunk would have uh, about 16% THC and just detectable. I CBD, neither weed might have 60% THC wow. and no, no CBD. So you get a greater bang from the, the THC and, you, get, you, and you, you don't have the ameliorating effect of the CBD in the more modern types. Um, is this because drug sellers have preferred to have the stronger one and incidentally it's... Yes, I think, uh, but also why, why do... Why do heavy, heavy alcohol users prefer a spirits? To, you know, you, 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 you tend to get tolerant, and therefore you want some, you want something yeah. str stronger. Of course, also it's easier. Uh, you can charge more, uh, and it's of course the question of portability. Uh, well, thank you. But, but, I, I but so there is an escalating race to increased potency of cannabis. But there are of course now synthetic cannabinoids, sometimes called spice. Yeah. Uh, or K2 and the THC is a partial agonist at the receptor so it binds loosely to the CB1 receptor the cannabinoid receptor mm 
things like spice, uh, they are 100% uh, agonists, so they hit the receptor in a much more strong way, right. and therefore you're like 30 times more likely to end up on an A and E unit if you take spice than if you take old-fashioned cannabis. Wow, there's a huge difference, isn't mm. there? Well, that's absolutely fascinating, Robin. Last sentence, what, are, what is the future likely to bring, do you think? One can't gaze into a crystal ball, but what are, what are the hot research growing points for the future, do you think? The sad thing about all we've been talking about is that it hasn't had a huge effect on treatment yet. But I think as we understand the biology, I think we'll be, and excuse me, not just the biology, and the, 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 the social science, we'll be able to split up psychosis into different types. I think yeah. uh, very biological types uh, and then uh, types secondary to, to, to social adversity and we'll have different neuro neurochemical types and therefore different drugs to treat uh, uh, different types. At present everybody gets a mixture of antipsychotics and if they're lucky uh, cognitive behaviour therapy yes. but it's all uh, it's a one for all treatment at present in yes. the future, I think, I don't know if the term schiz I don't think this term schizophrenia will exist. It will break up yeah. into different, uh, in, into different uh, uh, subtypes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Robin. That is fascinating, and I want to tell uh, people who are watching this that they can come and see you in person on Friday the 16th of March at the Emmanuel Miller Memorial Lecture put on by ACAM, <coughs> which as well as Robin will have sessions on depression, self-harm and school-based uh, interventions to reduce bullying and some of those factors, as well as the currently very prominent issue of uh, gender identity. Uh, Robin, would you be prepared to answer one or two questions that of have course, come yes. in? Thank you. <coughs> so, question one, is it possible that in the case of identical twins, the subjective experiences of the twins as individuals would impact the rate of expression and development of schizophrenia um, in yes. healthy and unhealthy parents? Yeah. Uh, 30 years ago, this was a very lively issue. <clears throat> and I think it's clearly the case that if you are an identical twin that you're much closer to to your sibling than you would be if they were you were just bro bro uh, brothers i the crucial studies i think well they, they may not answer your you, 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 you the, uh, your the questioner correctly there have been studies of identical twins reared apart so i uh, by mischance some some uh, Twins are separated and brought up in one, one uh, house and in another house, but they still have the same risk of psychosis. But of course, they're not with each other all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they're, they're, I mean, I've seen enough, and we used to collect twins, so, so I've seen enough cases where one twin goes psychotic and the second one is distraught by this. And the stress... I, I'm sure does contribute to their onset of psychosis, but it is psychosis that they develop rather than anxiety yes. or depression. Yes. Yes. But I should say, we used to think that the evidence for a genetic contribution came from twin and adoption studies. Yeah. Well, it does, but the big evidence comes from molecular genetic studies. Yes. There, are now, there are now a study, there's now a study of 66,000 people who had a diagnosis of schizophrenia versus 120,000 people who uh, were normal controls. And there are about 200 places, points on the genome where they differ, wow. which means there's at least 100 little genes for schizophrenia. It's not that you get a big gene and you're going to go psychotic. It's mm -hmm. like the genes that make some of us taller or some of us uh, uh, shorter or some of us fatter. Uh, so there are genes that will contribute uh, to your, vu your, your vulnerability. So we, can, we used to think 90%, 99% of the population had no genes for schizophrenia and one had a big gene of major yes. schizophrenia. Now we know they're distributed through the population. And we also know that psychosis is distributed through the population. That 10% of normal people... Uh, have a psychotic symptoms, they are totally paranoid about their neighbour 
or they or they think they can hear they can they 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 they, they hear a voice calling them. I no, we just have to accept that that's just normal and uh, yes. why should psychiatrists interfere? Yeah, fascinating. So it's not just a discreet thing. Um, another question is, what are your views about accepting drug-induced cases of psychosis into an early intervention psychosis service, which sees people up for three years? Do they need an early intervention psychosis service, or actually drug services to reduce their habit, or both? Well, they have psychosis, so they need treatment from psychosis. You, you, you have a myocardial infarction, you have a heart attack. You don't get stopped at the door of the coronary unit to see is this, is this induced by cigarettes or, or, or not. So I think they develop a psychosis. I then they need they do need to have a specialised input. The traditional treatment uh, for people with drug-induced psychosis in Britain is do uh, you think uh, uh, I, I think uh, your drug treat <coughs> your uh, your drug use has, has caused you to develop psychosis. No, I don't. I don't think this is right. Well, if you don't stop, you have to stop taking a, a cannabis. A, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Well, there's nothing we can do for you. And, and, you know, so, I think we need to have a much more sophisticated approach. I, and I, sadly, in the UK, drug units are 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 competent a, therapists for people with drug problems are few and far between. Uh, so re really we have thought that we have to develop this ourselves uh, and uh, it's the same with any type of, it's difficult to give up, it's difficult to give up smoking, it's difficult to, well, it's difficult to lose weight, it's difficult to, uh, to stop drinking, so you can't, and if you're psychotic it's more difficult, so we have to be patient, but, uh, and of course it's unlikely that an 18 year old will stop smoking cannabis because an, a an aging Scottish Calvinist tells them to do it. But if, if other uh, uh, people who've been through it, who've been through, developed psychosis, and, and there are quite a lot of uh, people who are willing to do this and be sort of advocates yes. and help people yes. to, to yes. get through the difficulties. Well, of course, all their friends are taking cannabis as well. It, it's a hard one, isn't it? Right, my last question, Robin, has come in is, can uh, CBT be used clinically? by professionals and psychiatrists as an antipsychotic. Yes, I think CBT is very important. I, I chaired the, a, a thing called the Schizophrenia Commission in Britain and we said every patient deserves to have the opportunity to have pharmacological treatment and they deserve to have the opportunity to have a psychological treatment. And the one which there is most evidence for is CBT. And I the trials, there are lots of studies of CBT and meta-analyses, and some of them say it has a big effect, and some of them say it has a very modest effect. It's more difficult to prove, of course. If it's a drug, it's a drug, you know, a, a medicine is the same everywhere, but you get good CBT therapists and you get tough ones. We've been very lucky to have very good CBT therapists, and I've seen people transformed wow. by... by a, been given under an understanding of of the sort of uh, 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 explanations as to why they misinterpreted the world in, in, in this way. So uh, CBT is very important, I think. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robin. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've learnt a lot. I hope our viewers have learnt a lot. Um, and this is part of a whole range of uh, ACAM free resources, including blogs, articles. Uh, recorded lectures, topic guides, so visit our website at uh, www.acamh.org and look at social media, ACAM, for latest news. Thank you so much. Thank you. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.